Okay. Hello and a very good evening to everyone who is logging in to this wonderful webinar which has been organized by the Chess Council of India. At the onset, I'd just like to thank CCI for basically doing this work repeatedly every Thursday for the past two, two and a half years. There is a lot of hard work and a lot of people that we should thank for, but I would really like to thank on behalf of everyone on this panel Dr. N.H. Krishna, sir, Dr. Narayan Pradeep, sir, Dr. Ashish Dude, sir, Dr. Anil Maske, Dr. Atri, Dr. Ravi Dosi, and of course, the wonderful Dr. Vijay Kumar Chenam Chetty Garu, who have, who have worked so hard to make this a possibility. Now, I would really like to thank them once again because they have selected a very unusual and a very unique topic which we need to discuss. Organ transplantation is a very alien concept and unfortunately has not really given, uh, does not have so many takers as we expect a country like India should. We had the Human Transplantation Organ Act in 1994 in India, which later got amended in 2011 and 2014. However, there is still a lot of work to do. To give you a very brief introduction, obviously any successful organ transplantation program needs three things. The first obviously is recipients where you need a lot of recipients who need to undergo the transplant. The second, you need a hospital with expertise, surgical as well as medical. And the third is good donors. So today we are going to be talking only about an aspect of the third point which I mentioned that is about donors and specifically we are going to be talking about brain death and what is its impact on organ transplantation and because this is uh, predominantly for pulmonologists we are going to talk in context of lung transplantation as well. We've got an amazing panelist lineup, you know, right from a transplant pulmonologist to a pulmonologist to a nephrologist, a neurologist, a legal expert, as well as a forensic uh, expert. You know, they say variety is the spice of life. I'm actually seeing it live right now. So without wasting further time, we would now like to start with the talks. There are going to be three talks. And the first talk, it is my privilege to introduce the following speaker, that is Sai Sampath Kumar, sir, who is Professor and Head of Department of Neurology in Narayan Medical College, Nellore, Andhra Pradesh. He is, uh, you know, he's got more than 32 publications. He's written three chapters in various textbooks of neurology. He is the National Executive Board Member of IAP Neurology Chapter. And he's the coordinator of the Board of Studies uh, Super Speciality in Dr. NPR UHS. His areas of expertise actually is movement disorder, Botox therapy, pediatric neurology. But today we're going to slightly deviate, sir, from you know his his areas of expertise. And sir is going to be talking about brain death and the challenges that we face with brain death. Thank you so much, sir. You can go ahead with the talk. So very good on you all. Uh, first of all, let me thank uh, Chest Council of India for uh, starting the very uh, clinically and uh, most legal-wise, most important topic uh, is a brain death. I think topic looks simple, but there is a lot of complex interplay between the various departments of the medical specialty. Even non-medical people have some role in uh, certifying the case and dealing with this protein practice and all. So brain death, I, I just take a few minutes of just introduce a topic to the audience. What is a brain death perspective? Uh, everybody very curious and very, uh, people think it is a very complex way, but technique is simple, but various aspects made it is very complex. So uh, just being a doctor for that matter, I'm being not a neurologist, not an intensivist, uh, think few concepts regarding brain death very simple way to make the diagnosis. So start with brain death is a, what we call like a medical legal term, basically. Uh, though recently people said like it is a death by neurological criteria. What do you mean by death by neurological criteria? Uh, in fact, some of the in my routine practice, when I supposed to go and declare the brain dead patient, some of the my junior doctors itself, they over the patients, patient attendants. Uh, what by dead brain dead, sir? Is a dead is there? What is a brain dead? Brain dead means in sense, not complete depth of the bodily functions. Uh, there are certain functions that are being preserved but brain functions are being irreversibly lost. 
that is a brain rate in simple way to any person to understand so that means brain functions are being irreversibly lost which cannot be reversible there are two certain functions patient may not in position to maintain those things but at least by external support they are still maintaining the respiration and ventilation respiration cord respiratory support that means cardiac and respiratory functions are being maintained in a patient where brain functions are not being restored to the normality that's a brain death simple definitions so in the present medical area where circulation respiratory functions can be maintained indefinitely by external life support because of all new gadgets of life supports the brain death or being dead has profound legal medical and social implications i said it is not only for medical it is both for legal and social implications so what do why, why you need to uh, stress the word brain death in routine practice and all by early recognition brain death is most important to provide uh, uh, to the close uh, the loving uh, attendants or family members is a prevent unnecessary negative medical interventions and when possible it only for organ transplantation so in is a myth is going on in the public even among the doctors brain death declared only for organ transplantation this is not true never never brain death is only to ascertain certain things to the patient attendant so that they can take the decision uh, before putting lot of things before prolong the things where patient cannot be reversible is state where patients can attendants can take some uh this uh, decisions to continue or not and all so don't think it is only for organ transplant shake we are pronouncing the word brain death so i think it's like historical events if you speak on over the period of time during various people which started organ transplantations like for example first kidney transplantation in illinois you will see the date back to 1950 now almost seven decades has gone now the first heart transplant in south africa this by the christian benard in 1967 there are very lancet papers uh there is harvard brain criteria where things has come into picture latest 2020 the various countries have took part and joined their hands and made specific uniform criteria what should be done so it has some historical events so date back to india also interestingly when uh, transplantation of human organ bill was passed the one persons one department people are always focused is my colleague people the neurosurgeons because they are all put into very proactive role to declare the brain death because they receive the most of the patients of trauma so subsequently most of the neurosurgeons uh, I, I, this looks very funny to me but they were all opined that uh, most of the people opined uh, those who opined that they would be pursued public as a organ procurers that's what they believed uh, most of my colleagues uh, so subsequently there is a lot of things happened and all these things this way uh, is basically not only for organ transplantation the one i want to stress the word it is brain death is to for various implications so brain death or death by neurological grade what do you mean by there is a complete or permanent loss of brain function as defined by unresponsive coma with loss of capacity for consciousness which goes for cerebral hemispheric activity is lost and brain stem reflexes are lost and ability to breathe independently so that means entire brain function is being seized which is irreversibly which cannot be reversible so there is a brain stem so this may result from cessation of oxygenated circulation to the brain or of devastating brain injury the one word i want to say permanent that means please be specific when you say permanent brain death permanent brain loss of functions means it refers to loss of function that cannot resume spontaneously and will not be restored through intervention that's the function of permanent loss of brain function so so we call it death by neurological criteria simple say so an also defined similarly the irreversible loss of entire brain including brain stem has been determined by demonstration of complete loss of consciousness coma which is being maintained by the both cerebral hemispheric activity and reticular activity system in the brain stem and brain stem reflexes are being lost and independent capacity for ventilated drive in the absence of any factors that imply possible reversibility is being lost so patient cannot breathe independently there are loss of brain stem reflexes and patient is not in irreversible coma so that means cerebrum brain stem is complete lost his functions as per an definitions so the few things which we always so diagnosis is depend on neurological criteria we call brain death so interestingly the new modalities of life saving measures like ventilation ecmo so many things have come into the picture so before the advent of mechanical ventilation the death was defined as cessation of circulation breathing now the death is being defined before the state as a brain death where 
circulation breathing is still maintained by the external support that's one thing you say so that's the difference between cardiac death and brain death so of course is a diagnosis of both medical and legal diagnosis with a lot of implication in it so i said where uh, axis involvement cortex brain stem the total respiratory system with various reflexes various functions which useful clinically so absence of neurological function of cns cerebral neurological activity activity is no possible and clinical instrumental diagnosis sometimes you make use of the things of uh, instrumental diagnosis to support the clinical diagnosis so the brain death uh, is usually death of the individual so what we say is sometimes we call it is a the treating neurologist he is with good brain activity should declare the patient's brain inactivity with the presence of intact cardiac respiratory system if you see the monitor most of the times before uh, going to the brain death patient declaration the monitor clearly shows the heart rate respiratory rate saturations but subsequently we uh, go with our ambulatory easy to the patient we record the no electrical activity we record in the electroencephalogram that's what we see wrote on the um, see in the bedside in the patient comes with brain death so clinical triad i said coma which is unresponsive irreversible absence of brain stem reflexes and apnea that means absence of respiratory drive it is only being supported by external measures so before you pronounce before you thought of brain stem brain death there are few things which i said like what are the gray areas if people have said in uh, concept of today's definition is uh, reversible cause of coma has to be ruled out for example a uh, patient takes some time to dig into the history what are the intoxications or drugs which has taken or including not only the intoxication alcohol something drugs which sometimes with the nurse drugs which produce neuromuscular blockade and primary hypothermia and hypovolemic shock what i'm saying is this is a most common thing most confusing thing we face in the bedside because most of the trauma patients they come with loss of blood which results in hypovolemic shock in those cases should be very careful when ascertaining the cardiac respiratory functions and metabolic disorder and endocrine disorders steps i said establish the etiology and exclude the reversible causes and take the help of clinical signs of coma and brain stem reflexia and apnea and uh, before the clinical examination i said like Uh, most times in, uh, in neurologists neurosurgeons intensivist physicians they are in hurry in eliciting the clinical signs showing that there is no brain stem reflexes before that all the during all the examination make sure that the adequate oxygenation ventilation has to be maintained so that means cardiac respiratory status should be very stabilized before you go for clinical examination so the presence of irreversible coma cessation of spontaneous respiration confirmed by our apnea test absence of brain stem reflexes absence of eye movements and caloric testing absence of motor response in any cranial nerve distribution for example uh, if you give the stimuli painful stimuli at least patients will show the grimacing reflex that is facial muscles being uh, contracted that is lost suppose trisseminal reflexes some all cranial nerve reflexes will be lost except few cranial nerve for example uh, 11th cranial nerve we call spinal accessory patients sometimes we give the stimuli in even brain dead patients they may some shrugging movements of the shoulders there is a spinal reflex there is not like a brain stem reflex that's why i said all cranial nerve functions are lost considered except spinal accessory there is a cranial nerve 11th which sometimes produce spinal reflex may not be considered as an indication not to declare brain dead be careful absence of motor response and stimulation of the face limp tone there is a simple motor response and of course there are specific criteria for different ages especially brain death declaration in case of children uh, when child of 7 days to 2 months there are two examination two ages 40 days apart and the 2 months to 1 year one examination patient require easy with electrical cerebral silence with angiogram showing no cerebral blood flow and more than one year two examination easy and both angiography is optional but 12 to 24 hours two examination has to be done so this is a criteria for especially for children as far as criteria latest criteria we considered for adult one single competitive to uh, examiner examination which suggests to of brain stem reflex lost with intact cardiac respiratory function with apnea test being positive then you can consider the brain stem declaration you need not examine uh, after a specific interval of time there is a latest criteria that declared this is when i think i'll go through before this lack of time the apnea test which i should be carried only when all precursors are met that means when patient uh, is maintaining the normal temperature normal cardiac respiratory state then you should apply the test and before that you should one should make sure that all trauma patients 
excludes phrenic nerve injury in spinal spinal column injury that may interfere with your uh, respiratory functions also so important thing at least has to be considered and prerequisites always said is the core temperature has to be maintained more than 36.5 a systole bed pressure should be maintained more than 90 and presence of euvolemia and patient should be eucapnia that means pcod around 40 so motor response to pain there are few things which i also said is uh exclude neuromuscular blocking agents patients because most of the times people kept on ventilator patient were in fentanyl medazolam neuromuscular back and drugs will be there you cannot expect the motor response make sure that neuromuscular blocking agents can produce prolonged weakness it has to be excluded if they are all recent being administered examination with a bedside peripheral calcimeter has to be kept in there so such a response should be grimace in patient or response thumb pressure supraorbital pressure we all make sure that motor response to elicit the patient's response then pupil response to the light of course we should exclude the drugs which given the any uh, midriatic drugs which should be given and all uh, just mere dilated pupil is not the indication for brain death okay they should be dilated with no response to the light that is the most criteria required sometimes dilated people you see in the some of the patients with traumatic brain injuries may not be brain dead so dilated or mid dilated the most promising what i say is unresponsive people that is the most the light that is the most thing we required so this one of course i will go through slides then other brain stem reflex we always look into the corneal reflex uh make sure that don't do repeated coronal examinations because if you do repeated coronal examination called sometimes coronal abrasions may come and these are undesirable because patient is a potential coronal donor also make sure that another thing an oculocephalic reflex to also moment make sure that patient cervical cord injury don't make very uh, flexible extension neck injuries and also should be has to not be happen and uh, today we are going yeah. to as so the other this patient i think the class clearly shows brain stem reflex of oxygen in the patient distance of there so there is option to either response the patient is moved to the right there is no sudden movement right pivoted me this one so there is another patient is shown the other thing is gag reflex sometimes patient was intubated you may not perform the uh, gag reflex and also what this way tongue reflex always to this He said, "Over a part of the patient, observe for any parietal pattern. That is a common thing. But most of the times, when you go to the bed and you go for declaration, patient will be on intubation. So it's always may not possible. So extubation is you know not do extubation for the gag reflex. Say, and cough reflex is always try to do because a suction catheter is introduced into the endotracheal tracheostomy tube to deliberate to stimulate the carrier, which is not possible most of the time. They are in with ET tube. So patient is closed observe for any cough response for movements of chest or diaphragm. That is the most possible way." So, so the pitfalls of clinical evaluation always to consider is the confirmed conditions, facial trauma, excluded, pre-existing pupil abnormalities, toxic level of surgery to drugs, ammonoglycosides, spicyclic antidepressants, anticholinergics, anti-epileptic chemotherapy agents, and neuromuscular blocking drugs, sleep apnea, severe pulmonary disease, resulting in chronic depression. These are all conditions. Keep it in mind before you go for brain declaration. So, following clinical observation is present. do compare with diagnosis of brain death may be a source of confusion so these things has to be excluded before you go for clinical evaluation so motor response i said like exclude all the things uh, especially the spinal reflexes uh, which origins of spinal cord nothing to do with the brain stem uh, i think i think you go to a period of time you will come to know there is simple like pathological flexion extension response uh, shoulder elevation i said which is back arching intercostal expansion without significant tidal volumes they should be interpreted as evidence as a brain stem function so so don't consider these are all brain stem dysfunction mostly because of spinal arginate reflexes which can be considered so sometimes patient has sweating blushing tachycardia normal blood pressure without firm pulse support sudden increase in blood pressure absence of diabetes insipidus occasional presence of deep tendon reflexes superficial abdominal reflexes triple flexion response babic it may also sometimes be present so presence of all these signs uh don't consider is a brain stem is intact those are all spinally activated reflexes so they can be considered with the presence of these things in other brain stem reflexes are lost patient is unresponsive to coma with apnea so he can declare the brain death so confirmatory investigations most of times if you clinically you are sure the apnea test is performed we need to go for legal purposes we have to go for some of the confirmatory tests which go for cerebral blood flow for example we do easy bedside four vessel conventional angiography transcranial dap and nowadays very useful of the icus 
brains integrity brain stem potential among all the most commonly which is convenient to the uh, uh, competitive uh, uh, neurologist to declare is easy bed cell can be done conventional angiography the problem is the most gold standard 100% diagnosis can be done but only thing is patient need to be shifted to the uh, lab where you give the contrast sometimes may picture the kidney dysfunction with contrast sometimes may happen so most times we go for organ donation for most for kidney transplantations or donor uh, by giving the contrast simple things may alter the function that is wants to be keep it in mind tcd is the best gold standard you can do it at bedside brain scintigraphy again uh, less avail centers are available with the brain scintigraphy like spect and pet so brain wave reproduction again one thing which uh, classically demonstrate the uh, across the spinal cord brain stem responses presence of the, so these are all two things we take the help of what the clinical diagnosis so all the patient with catastrophic brain injury with present with various images eeg shows uh, electro cerebral silence we call after proper recording for minimum of 30 minutes but in a setting in the icu settings where artifacts also will interpret the results so has to be excluded but there are few conditions apart from brain death where you won't get easy electrical activity in the brain for example patient with barbiturate coma status report because you may not get these things so make sure that and uh, sometimes eeg is significantly affected by hypothermia drug administration metabolic disturbances thus diminishing its clinical utility so keep all this in mind before you uh, uh ascertain the clinical diagnosis uh, support the clinical diagnosis with electrocerebral silence exclude hypothermia drug intoxications and metabolic disturbances and of course sensory evoked potentials will help you and conventional angiography the most gold standard keep it in mind few fit pulse uh brain death and catch cerebral angiography shows absence of flow in the intracranial especially intracerebral and vertebral artery flows there again various cases which we demonstrate here in our practice so I'll, of course this is integrity which clearly shows there is a absence of activity in the brain the arrows clearly shows there is no uh, uh, there is uptake of tracer in the uh, various flow stages which clearly shows the brain death clarification so tcd which is most useful we can be done at bedside so this what i think few things angiography normal you see clearly in case of cerebral circulatory arrest you cannot expect the flow and scintigraphy you see the clearly the normal patients in case of uh, brain death you cannot have any trace of uptake transcranial doppler dystonal peaks which clearly shows the cerebral circulatory arrest so various things which i said this is abstraction radio nuclear angiography radio nuclear perfusion scintigraphy transcranial doppler computer angiography among which the best the most diagnostic is conventional four way angiography of course uh, your radio nuclear angiography also gives some clues and with good expertise transcranial doppler relatively give almost 98% of sensory specificity uh, to support your clinical diagnosis of clinical, uh, brain death so the, what i said is basically like in the sense like uh, after all we do uh, very stringent criteria will be very competitive to uh, physician or surgeon or uh, emergency physician they all do things is prerequisites should be considered before you up, apply the clinical examination and before you apply the available investigations to support the clinical diagnosis exclude drug conditions or intoxications and all so of course we all do all this uh, discussion we all do is only for organ donation not only for organ donation it is to treatment withdrawal after taking the consultation or counseling with the patient attendants in case of no donation so to prolong life improve quality of life for organ donation so ultimately we do so the most thing uh, ultimately i want to say is when you word when you pronounce the word brain death is not only for organ donation keep it in mind so it is always to conclude the, my talk so there is always one thing i always underline is there is also an underlying understanding that the need to declare a person brain dead must be completely dissociated from the ever prevalent demand for organ donation so this is one thing keep it in mind so there are many medical social uh, social legal communities will come into the picture keep it in all those mind before you declare and for ultimately we all do is for better quality of life better improve quality of existing people by donate the organs thank you for the opportunity good day Thank you so much, Dr. Sampath Kumar, sir. That was a wonderful and dare I use the word lucid uh, talk. 
which you have given you have taken us back to our internship days when we actually used to roam around even with reflex hammers uh moving on the next uh, speaker is my dear friend dr shubham sharma who is a very young dynamic and upcoming transplant pulmonologist and is currently associated with mgm hospital in chennai now shubham has got various publications in national as well as international journals and he has also been a co-investigator in the embark indian registry which is pertaining to bronchic cases shubham today is going to talk uh, is going to briefly touch about lung transplantation in india as well as donor lung management shubham please go ahead with your talk a very good evening to everyone who has joined for this webinar by chest council of india i thank the cci uh, management and the people involved behind these educational videos and webinars and i thank dr kapil and everybody available and present on this panel tonight i am dr shubham sharma i am a consultant interventional pulmonologist and transplant pulmonologist at mgm healthcare chennai i'll be speaking about brain death while everybody will speak about uh, the legalities and the diagnosis of brain death me being a transplant pulmonologist i'll be basically speaking very shortly about the donor lung management why am i speaking about donor uh, lung management is another question before i go ahead with my slides i would like to say that the incidence or diagnosis of chronic lung and heart diseases are increasing and there is increasing need for patients who are going to end up on a thoracic organ transplant so it is important that the harvest of the organs improves and that is why donor lung management or donor thoracic organ management is an important aspect behind any brain death or behind any success of the thoracic organ uh, organ transplant program so going forward i would like to start with saying that thoracic organ transplantation like everybody uh, listening to this talk and on the panel would agree is an option to the patients with severe heart or lung disease and the benefit can be provided through transplantation while it is important to think about a recipient and to provide the benefit of quality of life and the length of life to these patients it is also important to respect the autonomy of the organ donor and the families of organ donor who have made these uh, this possible uh, just by the act of donation it is possible by only donation transplantation cannot happen without a cadaveric cadaveric donor program uh, if we speak about the thoracic organs we have to also respect the eth ethical principles and like i said autonomy of the donor and the benefit while it goes mainly to the recipient the benefit should also go to the donor in terms of respect of the ethics and the legalities the number of brain death donors in in the this part of this of the world which is asia or southeast asia if we speak about has increased significantly over the last 20 years while we were sitting at just 25 uh, donors brain dead donors in 2000 it has increased to 5357 as the exact number in 2019 which has led to if you come to the last line which is it has led to about 25000 or disease donor organs that were transplanted which means uh, each donor each donor is able to help at least 5 to 6 patients in the long run so brain dead donor has to be managed properly before an organ is actually retrieved the goal behind like i said before the goal behind managing a brain dead donor is to improve the harvest or improve the retrieval outcomes you have to understand that not all brain dead donors are ideal donors and 
not all organs can be used even if a patient or if the family has agreed to donate the organs after brain death so to improve overall uh, organ harvest it is important to manage these patients while they have been declared brain dead and once the consent has been obtained so what does a team do on arriving at the procurement center like i said we have to respect the autonomy and ethics so we have to always look for the consent for donation it is important to look for consent not only for one organ but every organ sometimes the families may not give or, uh, organ donation consent for thoracic organ so if they have been counseled and if they have given proper consent that should what be what we be looking for it is also important that the team going for retrieval also assesses and verifies brain death in their individual capability besides also noting the history of the patient the abo compatibility the compatibility of the donor with the recipient the serologies and the supplies in terms of consumables that may be required during an organ harvest if we talk about heart and lung management algorithm this is something that i have taken directly from the ishlt guidelines of uh, thoracic organ don donor management when when a family or a, uh, the next of kin has decided to donate the organ respecting the wishes of the donor if the patient has given a directive prior to the death uh, we have to assess the quality of the organs once we get a call about a potential organ donor what are the things that should be looked for in terms of thoracic organ harvest if we talk about heart we have to look for the echocardiograph to rule out structural and congenital abnormalities and valvular diseases and we also have to look uh, look for the chest x ray and blood gases making sure that the pf ratios are more than 300 if the echo is okay if the x ray is okay if the pf ratios are good the surgical team then goes ahead for the organ retrieval or recovery however like we are talking about organ management or donor management before we actually go for organ harvest there will be times that not all donors are ideal donors at the time of a donor call we may have abnormal x ray we may have abnormal echocardiograph and we may have abnormal pf ratios so to improve the likelihood of harvest or improve to improve the likelihood that we take that organ it is important to manage that donor prior to surgical retrieval which can be done by bronchoscopy ventilatory strategies hormone resuscitation besides other criteria that i will be discussing in the subsequent slides when we when it comes to ventilatory and airway management it is important that the donor undergoes protective lung ventilation strategies with limited tidal volumes and peep and optimized peep targeting somewhere between 5 to 8 cm as to additionally it is important not to over oxygenate the patient if the pf ratios are more than 500 it is also required that we come down on the fio2s as higher pao2s are associated with increased chances of bronchiolitis obliterans in lung recipient if it is if a donor who is peep dependent for whatever reason there are strategies to prevent or to improve the organ quality at the time of surgical retrieval tracheal suctioning or bronchoscopies can be done to clear out the airway secretions however they should be limited if we are suspecting that there won't be a lot of secretions and the pf ratios are okay to avoid the derecruitment of the lungs as these organ donors are likely to be road traffic accident uh, 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 cause being the uh, cause of death or brain death which may also be a cause behind a thoracic injury and it is important that we manage a thoracic injury or a contusion accordingly the endotracheal tube cuff should also be inflated to a pressure high enough to prevent aspiration and bronchoscopy is performed or a 
tracheal lavage or a secretion uh, microbiology is performed to rule out an active infection it is important that active infections are either ruled out or treated prior to an organ retrieval treatments such as mucolytic therapy and antibiotic guided as per the microbiology and steroids can be used depending on the donor lung condition and presence or uh, absence of infection in the donor lungs higher peep in combination with recruitment maneuvers and using protective lung protective strategies and judicious use of diuretics may also improve ventilation perfusion mismatch and increase the pf ratios when it comes to ionotropes and vasopressor support these patients have uh, the loss of sympathetic tone besides other hormonal imbalances so vasopressin has come up as the uh, first line agent uh, to uh, improve the uh, vascular uh, supply to the lungs or to improve the sympathetic tone dopamine may also be considered if the patient requires ionotropic support brain death results in a rapid decline of serum levels of cortisol antidiuretic hormone thyroid hormones and insulin so it is also important just like in, uh, managing the ventilator it is important that hormonal imbalances or disbalances are taken care of when managing a potential organ donor and this holds good for all organ donations not just thoracic organs methylprednisolone has been associated with significant preservation of systolic and diastolic cardiac function and a reduction in pro inflammatory cytokines high dose of corticosteroids are also associated with improved oxygenation and increased success rate of lung procurement when compared with controls to achieve these benefits methylprednisolone is best administered as soon as a brain death is confirmed and once the patient is considered a potential organ donor while methylprednisolone may be the drug of choice recent studies have shown that low dose of uh, hydrocortisone which is about 300 mg of hydrocortisone achieves similar improvements in hemodynamic stability and lung oxygenation with lesser incidence of hyperglycemia compared with methylprednisolone patients with brain death are also likely to develop diabetes insipidus to the tune of about 80% of these donors developing diabetes insipidus and treatment should be considered uh, with desmopressin if one or more of these criteria are met it can be either polyuria increased serum osmolality decreased urine osmolality and or hypernatremia in these conditions judiciously desmopressin can be used to improve the diabetes insipidus component and to improve the uh, electrolyte imbalance in these patients thyroid hormone again uh, uh, the replacement of thyroid hormone is debatable but most centers including us use thyroid hormone replacement for managing low ejection fraction or hemodynamical uh, hemodynamic instability in donors however the role is controversial it is it all varies from center to center hyperglycemia is also seen very commonly despite a patient not being diabetic a patient's insulin production is reduced uh, in patients after brain death so we use insulin infusion to manage hyperglycemia in these patients if it comes to antibiotics some centers use antibiotics prophylactic however it is important to practice antibiotic stewardship stewardship uh, including in the patients with brain death and it should be guided as per the microbiology if infection has been uh, found in a patient then it is important that the infection be treated as per the sensitivity pattern of the particular bacteria isolated it is important that we rule out tuberculosis active fungal infection in these patients as tuberculosis or isolation of mycobacterium is a absolute no no to or uh, for organ harvesting and it is 
very much important to take the opinion of an infectious disease specialist in deciding the use of antibiotics. So what is an acceptable donor criteria? After all the maneuvers that we do in terms of ventilatory strategies, hormonal replacement, fluid resuscitation, an acceptable donor is a donor whose blood gases show a PF ratio of more than 300 at least, but ideally more than 400. Beyond 500, it should not be targeted and FiO2 should be, um, uh, should be managed accordingly. Now, this PF ratio should be with a PEEP of 5 to 8 centimeter H2O and an FiO2 of 100%. Higher donor age is associated with poorer outcomes and so is the smoking history. So ideally, and a donor who is less than 55 years and has less than 20 pack years of smoking history are good donors if every other criteria is met. Like I said, chest radiograph should not show any evident uh, infection or a large contusion if a chest CT scan is available that improves the assessment of the donor lung quality prior to the team going for retrieval of the organ. Bronchoscopy can be done and similarly uh, the secretions from the airways can be obtained to uh, look for microbiology or, uh, or the infection in the patient and bronchoscopy also helps in clearing out the significant secretions which may help in improving the patient's overall, the donor's overall lung condition at the time of retrieval. While all these strategies are supposed to improve the donor lung condition or donor, or donor thoracic lung condition or thoracic organ condition, we have to understand that not all these criteria, even if they are met, are the ideal criteria. When the surgical team goes for retrieval, it is also the final post-surgical or once the chest has been opened, the assessment after that is important as the final uh, decision maker uh, point uh, once a team has decided to retrieve that organ. So while all the efforts should be made to improve the quality of the donor thoracic organ, it is also important to understand not every donor is an ideal donor and not all donor organs, even if it, the team has gone and surgically resected the organ or surgically assess the organ after opening the thoracic cavity, the, not all organs can be utilized because not all radiographs or CT scans and even bronchoscopies can actually give you the real picture. In many conditions, it is found that the patient's lungs are contused even if that was not visible on the chest radiograph. And it is important that we do not take the organs that are severely damaged, look infected, or are confused. And with that, I end my slides. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Shubham, for such a wonderful talk. We've obviously got lots of questions which we will cover in the Q&A session. Uh, the next speaker is Dr. Swarnalata Ma'am, who is a DM nephrologist and uh, uh, she's currently professor and unit head department of nephrology in NIMS Hyderabad. And she also is the head of Jeevandan Donor Transplantation Program, Government of Telangana. Um, she is an author of more than 80 publications in various national and international journals. She is going to be talking about Jeevandan Donor Transplantation Program. A very good evening to all of you. Let me first uh, appreciate uh, the CCI for having uh, selected such an important topic. The uh, concepts of brain death, uh, particularly with reference to lung transplantation, mm -hmm. and uh, I would like to thank Dr. Vijay Kumar Garu for uh, you know uh, selecting me to um, you know to, uh, talk on the topic of uh, the disease or transplantation program uh, journey in uh, Telangana State. So, uh, uh, so let us go to the uh, topic. 
so as you all know the latest advancement in modern medicine medicine is organ transplantation and of course the future is also on the xenon transplantation and organ and on chip unfortunately uh, looking at the world map so india doesn't doesn't represent in disease zone organ transplantation and it's the western part you know with the the uk and the us where the disease zone transplantation is happening uh, much and if you look at the last year data 40000 uh, people underwent transplantation in us and us stood almost 11th time uh, uh, in a row uh, for the maximum disease zone transplantation happening across the world and india it's minuscule it's not even 1 per million population when compared to the west and uh, these are the statistics of the organ requirement and unfortunately there is no proper figures for lung transplantation a lung transplantation though the liver and the uh, the uh, uh, kidney transplant has picked up the heart and lung is not much of a, you know uh, the transplantation happening and more so with the lung transplant so but do we have uh, any legalities of the organ transplantation yeah, yeah, of course yes it started in 1994 with the act of human organ transplantation act and subsequently there have been several amendments in 2011 and into latest in 2014 this is the uh, the act the rule amendment and there has been little amendments particularly with respect to disease donor i would like to mention is they have tried to you know include even the physicians or the surgeons who are trained in disease donor in brain declaration Uh, we not need not require the expertise that is neurologist or neurosurgeon that's a major amendment with respect to disease donor transplantation uh, in our country and uh, as, i mean uh, i'm not going to the details of the act of course our i think our subsequent speakers are or am talking on the act part but however i would like to emphasize there are few geos which has come up in few of the states particularly with respect to brain dead declaration the first one was tamil nadu who has come out with a, a geo in 2000 as early as 2008 they said that the declaration is mandatory particularly in government hospitals okay. subsequently kerala in uh, 2000 uh, 2000 year 2000 they also have come up with a, 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 a geo uh, with respect to guidelines for brain dead declaration certification and in, in fact kerala also said that a uh, patient uh, or the ic should have a counselors and it is mandatory on the part of the, uh, the neurologist or the neurosurgeon or the treating doctor to declare a brain death if they come across a patient who is brain dead and it is mandatory for the icus to have a coordinators and counsel the family members of the uh, the brain dead for the organ donation and recently it was a gujarat who has come up with a similar uh, geo in fact gujarat has come has uh, made one step forward saying that uh, if the family members do not agree for organ donation the all life support can be with with the drug but i don't know how how far it is being useful in increasing the organ donation rate in the respective states But if you look at the organ donation in uh, the india it's only southern part which have been actively doing including uh, the uh, telangana karnataka of course kerala there are some issues and then uh, in the maharashtra and uh, some parts of uh, uh, gujarat I mean uh, it's not happening in majority of the uh, north part of the india so where is the problem so it is uh, the recent survey which was published in 2018 Uh, across various countries you may you'll be surprised to you know look at the results of this survey it said india the even most of the people when they when uh, they had interviewed most of the people are in favor of organ donation so but this this suggests that the people are not you know are not the challenge it's not the you know the organ donation from the public it is basically the the laws the policies which are defective in india and it is as a um, in a medical profession so medical fraternity it uh, becomes our responsibility to you know uh, convey this to our government or the our uh, uh, the legal structure to see that it may the organ do- and, uh, donations are happening and for a successful program i think these are this mean um, uh, structure we should follow and the, i think we, and the same thing we have followed in in our state telangana which is responsible for the one of the successful model in the entire country so fund first and foremost thing we should have a, a government participation there should be a platform by the run by the government and uh, the neurologist and neurosurgeon should be well uh, you know, trained in uh, the or uh, the brain dead certification and of course uh, the hospital should be sensitized both the public and private hospitals and most of the organization because it comes from uh, um, road traffic accidents we should have uh, the sensitization of the police people the forensic people 
for the post mortem and the uh, the panchanama and of course the public participation is very important and to have a public uh, confidence we should have a very transparent organ allocation which is equitable uh, it, which is accessible and which is transparent so we should have a proper uh, allocation policies i think most of the countries they have their own policies i'll discuss about this policy in our state which is one of the you know major uh, i can say uh, you know a point which has led to a success of our, our program and of course we need to have public education programs and another key person in the entire program is the transplant coordinator because he is the one who is in the forefront and he is I mean, the coordinator tries to you know coordinate with the look at the logistics coordinates with the each and every team and the whole it coordinates the entire process right from the identification to handing over the body to the uh, the family members so if we have a very smart coordinator in the entire program i think half the job is done so that's how the importance of the uh, transplant coordinator in the entire program is so coming to our program the the, the, the disease zone transformation program in telangana is called jeevandan so we started our journey in 2010 with a geo so our government has come up with a, a geo uh, basically it has two uh, major uh, committees one is the apex committee where the health secretary is the chairman of the committee and the superintendents and directors of the private I mean, government public hospitals are the members of that committee and the second committee is the uh, the act which is constituted by the director of medical education be the chair person and it is basically uh, uh, runs the day to day activity of the entire program so there are sub committees which look into the scientific and then uh, the organ allocation policies which recommends different policies to the apex committee and where it is uh, the policy decision is taken so with this background the uh, the nodal office was inaugurated at in 2000 in uh, 12 june it's been a decade now at nizam sutra medical sciences by the health secretary then so we have a uh, the structure well uh, structured program uh, with the nodal office at nizam sutra medical sciences we have a chief administrative officer followed by the administrative staff and, and we have four wings each looking into the one aspect that is the soft software production uh, the public education program the counselor and the training program for the medical education and the entire process starts with the identification of potential donor and then information goes to the concerned person then the brain that the determination the uh, family I mean, uh, uh, consulting or family counseling for the organ donation then optimizing the donor the organ allocation policy organ procurement the transplantation follow up these are the steps in, involved in the organ transplant i think we should look into each and every step before we have a successful program The first thing is the brain death certification. I think the subsequent speaker would be talking on the brain death certification. So I mean, I'll not be uh, covering this part. And uh, subsequent, most challenging is the optimization. As you all know, the brain death is a dynamic state. There is a lot of the uh, the hormonal, the uh, 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 the inflammatory storm uh, ha happening here, hemodynamic storm happening in, the, in such a patient, which leads to either hemodynamic instability or the metabolic failure. Ultimately, leads to organ damage. So, if you do not optimize it properly, we are not going to. Even though there is there is successful organ donation and then uh, the consulting or payment and declaration happening, we we'll, may end up in having the organ which is not good for the organ transportation. and in this forum we are when we are talking about the lung transplantation i think we should have a specific parameters with respect to the history respect to the optimization of the donor that is the uh, you know looking at uh, the uh, uh, the infection in the lung because most of the patients are on ventilator at times we need to do a ball also bedside and of course there is always a conflict of interest between the manage fluid management with respect to kidney uh, the retrieval and uh, and now the lung retrieval to begin with the program started with the only kidney retrieval so we were actually concentrating getting on hydrating the patient to maintain the adequate urine output and the kidney function but subsequently now we have moved to multi organ retrieval where the heart and lungs are also being retrieved and, and now the fluid management has shifted to a uh, something like a, a, a low volume status to preserve the lungs so i think we should also know about this optimization again subsequent speaker, speaker will be talking on the uh, the optimization particularly with respect to lung and of course retrieval again it's a team work you need to coordinate with the uh, the different teams particular kidney liver heart lung uh, uh, particularly now that we have going for a multi organ retrievals and particularly lung also i think it's a lot of coordination is required so but once you know the when the cross clamping is done the first the organ to come out is the uh, the heart followed by the lung in that process we should be very careful that you know the lungs are, the, uh, the liver and the kidneys are not compromised and the quality of the organs are maintained this is very important and we need to have a training of all these is to have a successful program
of course there is a responsibility of the package also and of course we need to have different fluids uh, mean uh, available and there are different fluids being used for different organ uh, perfusion fluids for the organ retrieval there are again static and dynamic i think uh, this also i mean uh, we need to um, sensitize ourselves and then train ourselves respect to how to package and the transport the organ as well so most important aspect of the entire program is the organ allocation power policy as i said each country has their own organ allocation policy basically the organ allocation policy is required because we have a shortage of the organs and it should be going to a patients who are deserving but but then each and every person should be accessible to this organs irrespective of their status status and it's, it's not like that you know patients are uh, 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 waiting and they are access, it's accessible it, organ should go to that patient okay. in the, we should also able to balance that you know it's not like you know young do, uh, kidney or the organ is going to an elderly recipient where the organ survival rate is very patient survival rate is very less so it should be optimally utilized because these resources are limited it should be optimized utilized and should be transparent these are the basic principles of the organ allocation policies so we have come up with our own organ allocation policies to we have this kidney wait list and based upon the weight different score system and different parameters again i'll not go into the different parameters because it again requires a lot of discussion i think we can have a separate meeting or it's available in our own site we can go through so we have different parameters and we have a cumulative scores and basing upon the score and the organs are allocated here you can see we have two organ two kidneys in from a donor so one goes to the in house and in house again i don't know whether we are able to appreciate we have this score generated so maximum is a score they'll give on a priority and the other kidney goes to the common pool common pool is a patient based not a hospital based they are, are again i mean uh, allocated as per the maximum patient score and so also liver liver we have followed the mel score so depending upon the mel score they have the seniority and that's how try to allocate the organ and we do all have a super urgent criteria also depending upon the urgency of the organ requirement we have certain criteria for the liver the basic upon the, what is the cause of the underlying liver disease whether it's a poisoning or hepatitis b and c whether it's wilson's disease so we have different criteria so to satisfy if their patients are satisfied they fit into a criteria of super urgent so and then multi organ takes a precedence like multi if their patients register for the multi organs they get a priority so i what i mean to say is we should have a organ allocation policy and then it should be transparent and to have a transparency I mean, unless we have transparency we cannot you know have the confidence of the public and public will not come forward for organ donation so for transparency we need to have a very good you know digital way of allocation system now everything is digitalized so even the organ allocation should be digitalized so the scientific way of organ allocation of course the scientific come you know the committee will recommend but in that then it should be you know uh, put it across to the public or the patient so that uh, in a transparent way so that the patient when uh, people will get the confidence and public will come forward for organ donation so we have very good uh, uh, the portal that's called jeevandan.gov.in you can just go through the portal so this is a dashboard which reflects everything the patient waiting list the hospitals whenever we had donor donors alert is i mean uh, uh, alert, alert is made and depending upon the donor parameters whatever the allocation policy we have discussed before that is in, inherently incorporated in this portal and organs are alloc allocated automatically uh, with the click of a, uh, a button so no one can interfere this and uh, mind you we have not um, you know and, uh, violated this uh, Uh, bypass this waiting list are given to any of the people because it is it is uh, captured it is being reflected into the public domain and it and it has been audited every uh, frequent interval of time so uh, there are, there are about uh, 34 hospitals being registered with us in jivanta and as you can see it started in 2000 the whole of the ground work including the, the development of the software and the policy decisions was done in 2012 and donations has started from 2013 as you can see there has been steady increase in the organ donation rate from 41 in the year 2013 to this year it is so far it is around 150 plus donations and there was a mild decrease in you know during the covid period i think uh, it was a universal phenomena all departments were affected and so also the organ donation and this is the transformation program as well so as on today we have around 1000 plus you know uh, brain dead donors donated their organs in the uh, jeevandan around 1600 plus kidneys and the liver around 1000 plus look at the heart and lung so just i want to emphasize few things in heart and lung you know so before this covid there was not not much of a uh, organ transplantation happening though there were a lot of donations happening there was no increase in the lung utilization of the uh, lung uh, as an organ 
but only after covid there has been an increase in the lung utilization rate the same thing is reflected in graphical representation also the violet uh, you know the bar is the lung as you can see it's been uh, happening only in the last uh, few years after the covid and uh, as of now around 8000 people have registered for organ transplant various organ transplant in various hospitals so that is the waiting list uh, the success of the program i can also say that as i said equi equitability so uh, it should be available to you know even uh, the uh, the, uh, the uh, poor people so in government hospital also this transplantation organ transplantation is being done so so far we have done 423 organ transplantation the various organ transplantation in non the government public sectors in the government so there should be a balance between the by the private and public sectors once the organ transplant is happening in public sector is easily accessible to a people who are who are not affordable and accessible they you know it it builds a it builds up the confidence of the uh, you know entire program so and it is free of course now that they have to pay it is free of course is being covered under arugeshi in fact after this uh, this only we have given inputs to our uh, the national programs and is being covered in the even the national uh, insurance policy as well so i was i was telling that the one of the key person in the entire program is a transplant coordinator if they are smart i mean half of the job is done so they they are the person who you know uh, first try to approach the family members convince them in the you know point of grief they coordinate with the uh, the uh, you know the treating team for the declaration they coordinate with the optimizing team for the proper optimizing of the organ they coordinate with the police and forest to get the legal things completed they only coordinate with the there is with the help of the uh, jeevandan or any of the organ transplantation organization they try to coordinate the recipient uh, and the calling them to the hospital and then fixing the on particular time for the organ retrieval and coordinating with the all the uh, retrieval team for the retrieval and ultimately ends up with the i mean uh, hand, handing over the body to the family members so these are the things various challenges and if they are, i mean we have very good coordinator these things can be a uh, smoothly done so there is no structured uh, program for the training of these transplant coordinators in any of the university so we have come up with a very proper uh, uh, what do you call uh, uh, um, uh, course cur curriculum and we have come up with a, a, a textbook also and it contains all the uh, in uh, required information and in fact it's also available in our website you can just go through our website and this is one of the tra tra training program we have conducted we have uh, so far uh, trained around 400 people across uh, our state in uh, uh, in training of the transform coordinators and we give a certificates at the end of the course another important challenge is the uh, the uh, the religious the myths um, associated with the organ donation so as you all know india is a secular country we have uh, various religious and uh, to uh, to motivate this uh, the religious scholar i think we have, i mean uh, we can motivate the most of the people also we can just get rid of all these myths uh, about the organ donation in the uh, uh, society so we try to meet the religious scholars and we try to particularly with respect to few of the communities who are against this organ donation and with the help of the religious scholars we could actually you know take this to the uh, community for in motivating them for organ donation so the police it is an important uh, you know the stakeholders i think particularly most of the time it's made medical legal cases accident cases so we need to coordinate with the uh, the police for the clear clearance and not only for the medical legal cases they have been very helpful so we had a training program several training program for the police and we have told them about the different challenges so they are working beyond that medical legal cases and in fact they are trying to counsel the family members and one more issue was you know it was very difficult for us to mobilize the police from the uh, place for where the first fires was done and then you no know, police coming there so we had to come up with certain policies where the uh, police which is attached to nearest uh, hospital they can do the whatever is required inquest and then can send to send the report to the concerned fri uh, police station so we have come up with all those policies in the beginning of the program they help us in creating the green corridor so they are also helping us in counseling in fact when the police you know they come and they counsel in in situations where it very difficult for the for us for the coordinators to convince them so in fact we have mobilized the local leaders and local police people also so once they come and counsel it brings in you know the lot of confidence and then you know the uh, uh, what do you call um, um, the legality legal, legal aspect of it so so that's how it, I mean, police has been helpful in uh, uh, in our program in creating awareness so this one thing i want to emphasize is donor condolences program so one challenge we have faced is you know people um, particularly when they are coming from remote villages they you know uh, when they come, our coordinators counsel them 
they have certain apprehensions when they go back and to the villages they they will be you know uh, dejected by the uh, what do you call the uh, fellow villagers saying that you have you know done something done something wrong you have sold your organs so we try to go we uh, go along with them we try to you know honor them with the, within the uh, their own uh, uh, the you know co villagers and make them a hero in, in in front of them and then you know the it, it creates a positive vibration and whatever the negative fear apprehension they had they try this transform into heroism so that's how this is also helped us in creating awareness particularly in uh, villages and we do a donor fill station programs though may there be a lot of controversies going on with respect to whether dolly from donor family should be you know given some nascent benefits or not so of course they should not be given uh, given any monetary benefits but however uh, we can help with the government in uh, you know giving uh, uh, the other uh, renting the other help for example giving education to the you know children or uh, some other help we are trying to do on a personal basis so as i told like you know it's not the public the basic uh, you know resistance is from the medical fraternity itself so we should try to educate our medical fraternity particularly at the entry level and at the you know mbbs level itself so we are trying to motivate them at the mbbs course itself when they want the concepts of uh, the brain, uh, brain death and uh, how to optimize the brain death and of course we regularly do a public education program it's not a overnight it's a continuous process we every uh, program we try to somehow we try to you know catch up of the uh, celebrities or we uh, you know try to correct code and hold of the politicians or the legal persons and we even small small events also we have these stalls available and try to motivate educate the public and uh, we try to you know uh, uh, do certain uh, what you call walkathons and you know marathons and motivate in in case of uh, organ in terms of organ donation and of course the one of the important uh, um, the uh, people who can influence the society is the media so media has also been very helpful in you know creating an awareness by publishing the success stories of the people so that's how we have been uh, I mean successful in having us uh, one of the best model in the country for the organ donation and we have got us few uh, rewards for that also one of this is the website website uh, the software which we have developed has been adopted by the adjacent state as well including the karnataka kerala the gujarat now the orissa is and then uh, even lucknow has approached us in fact we have helped the even the noto also in bring up their own uh, the web portal so for that we have got a best uh, you know website uh, the scotch award in 2015 and then again 2020 this was 2020 before covid so we have also got a I mean, award from the noto for the one of the best performing state in uh, in, in in our country and uh, one of the important factor in creating awareness taking it to uh, our education level so this is uh, i think with uh, one of the achievement i can say so this is there in our 10th uh, class uh, state syllabus about this talks about the organ donation including the brain death and then you know given that program as well so i think next subsequent generation whoever is you know has studied 10th class they would all know about the organ donation the parents would know the teachers would know that so we have created a awareness among the next in a generation so i think we have surpassed the, the even uh, the tamil nadu which was supposed to be number one in organ donation so we have surpassed them in 2019 itself and even in other other southern states we have been performing very very good so slowly we are trying to expand now that it is restricted to a city like hyderabad we are trying to expand it to the district level so we are trying to have a, a zonal centers in each and every districts with a you know a, a, a nodal officer and a team who can work on their bringing awareness and uh, you know identifying all these government hospital as a non non uh, the non transplant organ retrieval centers and only so that's why we are trying to you know expand our program and slowly we are also connected to the uh, the national level through not uh, through roto and uh, uh, so uh, noto sotos and rotos i think it's uh, you know uh, a national program where we can uh, I mean offer the organs if it's not being utilized in our state or we can get also so other way around we have been actually getting organs from the other state because uh, i mean uh, uh, ours has become one of the hub for organ transplantation hyderabad has become a hub for organ transplantations so this is how we have evolved and we are in the social media as well so we have been trying to you know now that uh, the uh, basically awareness is through the shamana the new platform called social media we try to be active in the social media as well thank you thank you for uh, the patient listening of their queries i am happy to uh, answer all these queries thank you thank you very much Thank you so much, Swarnalata, ma'am. I think that was an excellent talk, and 
the amazing transparency which you have in terms of organ donation that anyone at any time can actually access the statistics is i think uh, amazing and there's no wonder that uh, telangana is number 1 as far as organ transplantation is concerned and i hope that the other states also follow soon uh so that's it with regards to the talks we will now go to the question and answer session uh we have got three more panelists who will also join us so the first is dr yadukul sir who is the deputy medical superintendent in aims hyderabad he is the associate professor of department of forensic medicine and toxicology aims hyderabad sir is on this panel because he is going to give us an input from the forensic aspect uh with regards to organ transplantation the second is dr vinay kumar sir who is currently working as a professor and hod at caims karimnagar telangana so he is also running his own full fledged chest hospital in karimnagar since the past 15 years and uh, the third is dr kinjal modi sir who is a very dear friend and a senior and one of the leading uh, consultant pathologist in mumbai uh, practicing in hinduja hospital but uh, dr kinjal is not in this panel from a pathology point of view very important to mention this he is from a legal perspective and he is going to give us excellent inputs uh, as far as the legal aspect of organ transplantation is concerned before we dive into the question and answer session i've just got word that are more than 850 logins which is excellent for a topic such as this to see so much of interest so uh, let me straight uh, start with uh, dr sampat uh, kumar sir sir you had an excellent presentation with uh, regards to brain death but since majority of us are pathologists it's been ages since we even held a reflex hammer so if you could just basically tell us what is the difference between brain death coma and a permanent vegetative state yeah i think yes the thank you for all nice presentations uh, the first thing i think uh, is all subset of various states of uh, altered conscious states we can call so i think vegetative state is a part subset of coma in fact so just simply to say in simple words uh, coma is like a uh, stuck like asleep but can't be awakened okay so where patient will not have cognitive functions but norms repair pattern will be there whereas vegetative state we call simply like a unresponsive awakeness state so patient is awakened but is unresponsive to things either the motor or to the verbal stimuli external stimuli you not be there so whereas brain dead of patient will be completely unresponsive coma state but this patient cannot revert back to the normal state that's one point you can say there are subsets i think you can say they differentiate coma from vegetative state, state and all of course okay. etiology can be same for all the states but only thing is uh vegetative state, state where you can have like a patient will not be unresponsive but can be wakeful state whereas coma is awake and state looks asleep okay okay sir and furthermore according to you which specialist should be involved in the diagnosis of brain death apart from a neurologist yeah i think my colleagues neurosurgeons can be there i think anybody do is both like uh, intensive uh, neurological assessment like because intense based on a course like emergency physician what dealt with okay. routine like emergencies of neuro okay. okay assess the glasgow coma scale you can assess cursory uh, simple uh, basic neurological examination in coma patients uh-huh. which are well versed patients are i think it can be competitive to any physician but as per career say physicians like emergency physicians intensivist at no faculty can be done okay okay so then i move on to dr kinjal modi sir as i mentioned sir you are here from basically a legal perspective so i have got two questions for you to begin with the first is Uh, as sampat kumar sir mentioned that there are going to be a number of specialists who might be involved in the diagnosis of brain death can one of them also be uh, can take the lead to talk about organ donation that's the first question the second is a very broad question to you what do you think can be the possible legal implications in organ transplantation uh right uh, so first question i like to answer first is very simple to answer because in the team as dr sampat presented very nicely uh it's a very and before i answer that question i really appreciate uh, dr kapil that uh, topic is selected and what you are moderating that topic is gathered a, more than 850 people on this platform is really good uh, thank you cci for uh, getting me also on the board and as a legal expert uh, <laughs> being a pulmonologist uh, thanks for that but the simple thing is if one of the member who 
is going to declare the person as brain dead is also involved in the lung transplant or any transplant issues uh then there is there is a conflict of interest and def- definitely there should not be there so it is not regarded uh, uh, ethical uh, in that sense so it's very easy to understand that uh, he will try to convince the person more towards the uh, transplant side which may be or may not be true so definitely that kind of people should not be there you can have a totally uh, neutral people in the uh, whole uh, panel uh next question what you answered me the legal aspect regarding the organ transplant is a very broad uh, uh, qu- uh question to answer basically to start with uh, uh, when dr sampath was giving presentation i was remembering few things that he showed some uh, nice transplants and uh, uh, when the first transplant was done all those things i remembered uh, from the mythological days uh, i think the first transplant what we know is i think so shri ganesha because uh, as you know the whole story that unfortunately dot shiva had uh, uh, chopped off his uh, uh, head because he was not allowed to go inside his own house and finally got a transplant of a elephant face on that that was the first transplant we know of and after that uh, even people say that dr ganesha was obese because he was impulse from more of steroids so this is <laughs> i was re- recollected one of the events that transplant has been there for many years right but the legal aspects are very much coming in picture nowadays uh, unfortunately starting from that uh, point what you told that declaring a person brain dead that is first and foremost thing which dr sampath has taken very nicely i don't want to go into details of it but yeah according to the organ transplant uh, act there has to be a panel and it has to declare the death which is mentioned in the definitions that there should be no activity of the brain stem at all and what uh, has been stressed is permanent and irreversible words are very important so that has to be stressed had to be confirmed with all the investigation mentioned in the previous uh, slides and definitely that's first thing and, and that's the first legal aspect second generally comes in picture is who will give the consent for the organ transplant the person is eligible for uh, as a donor so that also comes as a uh, very much okay. legal aspect with someone opposing it as uh, dr madam also said that basically if there are people around uh, five relatives and one opposing it should we go for it should we no go not go for it so legal aspect says that if everyone agrees then only it is better to go for it if okay. anyone opposes it then basically we should not okay. go for lung transplant but even one person opposing it so that is Perfect. very clear uh other aspect basically what we can go further is i think dr kenjal we we take this to and we'll, we'll include the others also in the conversation i'll come back sure. to the other legal aspects Excellent. also so i just want to get dr vinay kumar sir uh, into the conversation sir of course you are practicing as a pulmonologist for so many years i just want to ask you the same as interventional pulmonology when it started there were only few centers and right now almost everyone is associated with interventional pulmonology do you think the same concept should also extend to transplant pulmonology do you think that every pulmonologist should be involved in transplant pulmonology or do you think it should be a separate niche subject sir so, sir so, uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, cci for involving me and dr vijay and dr uh, kapil sir uh, thank you very much so ideally i believe uh, so the transplantation has evolved so much so initially so every pulmonologist sh- should understand so which cases need to be referred uh, but as it is a complex uh, procedure and requires multidisciplinary approach and readily available physicians and specific uh, even uh, prior to the transplantation and post transplantation so if we mix with the general pulmonology the very idea of uh, uh, benefit ultimately to the patient i believe is jeopardized so needs specific uh, pulmonologist uh, please okay. okay i believe the outcome okay. will be very well very good okay i am sure that uh, dr shubham is uh, very happy after listening to your answer but uh, moving on i just want to get uh, dr yadukul sir also into the conversation sir now the role of forensic in organ transplantation is a huge thing we've got a separate branch which is known as forensic thanatology just correct me now i just want to ask you a very specific question what do you think are the toxicology confounders in a diagnosis of brain death well uh, 
to the first question which you asked uh, regarding the forensic thanatology it was a uh, these are the changes that occurs after death and uh, it was very important for a forensic uh, expert like it was mandatory because we know that uh, most of the brain death that is mlc cases that is medical legal cases and it involves police as well as forensic aspect so at the days like uh, it it was a delay from our end because so many legalities has to be fulfilled before we actually take a post mortem of the body and hand, hand over the uh, a body for a transplantation but now i think uh, recently uh, government of india has uh, is promoting doing autopsies after sunset that is one good thing and they have clearly mentioned the autopsy should be given priority for those which uh, require organ transplantation and in many states uh, i want to clarify this before this uh, notification also in many states we used to do post mortem even in the evening hour okay to felicitate this organ transplantation so more or less as a forensic expert we are more concerned with the time since death regarding with regards to the thanatology and that is not a problem nowadays because we are doing immediately the post mortem as all the legalities are fulfilled okay secondly related to the toxicology i think uh, the only two issues which will come into a place is one the amount of alcohol so that i think we can just easily test for qualitative and quantitative analysis of alcohol at any laboratory which is nearby and the second one is uh, chronic poisoning especially with regards to the metallic poisons chronic heavy metal poisons that we have to rule out before uh, doing this transplant okay okay perfect perfect now i would just like to get uh, shubham on to you know for uh, for uh, for certain questions uh two questions to you shubham the first is uh do you think that the pulmonologist should be a part of the retrieval team that's the first question and the second question i think apar has posted a very interesting question what do you mean by dbd and dcd and what are the protocols for both of this uh, <clears throat> uh so papa uh, very good question uh, including uh, from dr apar so dbd and dcd are two different terms one is after brain death and one is after circulatory death so uh, the outcomes are uh, so because we need to have more organ harvest so we are not moving uh, uh, forward from just dbd which is brain death and uh, moving to circulatory death also in terms of taking organs from uh, patients who wish to uh, uh, donate their organs or the families of the fa- uh, of these patients who wish to donate these organs <laughs> thing uh, is that uh, the the outcomes are similar and uh, and uh, i think uh, the legal experts will be able to answer uh, better in terms of uh, uh, in terms of circulatory death uh, compared with brain death in terms of organ donation the other question that you asked was uh, was about uh, uh, about uh, pulmonologist being uh, there for organ retrieval so uh, see it takes a village to transplant one organ it is not just one man effort it is not just uh, not just the surgeon it is not just the pulmonologist it is not just the transplant coordinators that um, uh, people have been talking about it is not just the nurses it is not just a critical care person it is not not a one man's decision so it is a combined decision and usually uh, the thing about taking an organ starts with the pulmonologist uh, when the call about or, or an or a potential organ donor comes to a center the pulmonologist has to take a call about uh, if you are going to take the organ or not based on what the lung looks like on the radiograph and on the blood gases and depending on the history of the patient so uh, while this is a remote thing that a pulmonologist has to do it is also the uh, also the evaluation on site that the pulmonologist require is required to be at so at our center we are involved so uh, surgical team and pulmonologist we all uh, work in uh, in terms of organ retrieval and pulmonologist is not just there for decision making but is also there for organ assessment at the uh, site of organ donor and also for organ uh, so donor management wherever the organ is available okay perfect that was a wonderful answer so next is i would like to get swarnalata ma'am on to you know this uh, discussion 
Now, ma'am, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. The first kidney transplant in India was done approximately 1971. So this is a field which has it's almost more than 50 years into practice. The average number of kidney transplants donors I'm talking about per year in India is is really huge. Now, lung transplant at the same time in India is a very upcoming branch compared to kidney. So, what should the lung transplant community in India learn from the kidney transplant community? Now, uh, uh, yeah, as you rightly said, the kidney transplant is one of the oldest program and most successful program. So there's a lot of you know points in favor of that because we have uh, two kidneys, we have you know the uh, options called dialysis for the and uh, maintenance of the patients who are on failure, and then you know like uh, uh, technically, and then it is easier for the transplant kidney transplantation and post-operative also the follow-up of the patients is easier with respect to immunosuppression and all those things, and uh, uh, like uh, and in fact the legal all the legal. Uh, uh, aspects have uh, come up with only kidney transplantation so in before it started in uh, nine, uh, 1971 uh, but the act has come in 1994 so during this period there was a lot of you know what you call commercialization of this organ transplantation in fact it was the kidney transplantation which led to the development of the act and the you know the legalities of organ transplantation so and it has now developed to a, one of the uh, the most successful organ transplant. I think definitely all other, not only the lung transplant, all other organ transplantation should should uh, learn from the the kidney, the technical part of it, the legalities part of it, the immunosuppression part of it. So to be frank, our own uh, the uh, the colleagues, the CT uh, surgery colleagues, whether they look a lung transplant or the kidney transplant, they always approach us for the particular immunosuppression protocols. So because we uh, we know about these immunosuppression drugs and then how to you know the adjust and I mean having said that it is always an art. So we cannot have a generalized protocol for all the patients with respect to the you know, immunosuppression. We have to you know it's an art of balancing the immunosuppression and the infection. And coming to the lung because uh, uh, again as I said. Uh, there is a lot of uh, things we have to learn. Uh, it has to evolve in lung transplantation. We have uh, picked up only after COVID when we, we saw the lung being damaged, patients were put on ECMO. The concept of ECMO has also come up recently only when we are able to maintain the patients who have the lung failure and buy some time and you know wait for the organ to be uh, uh, to have the organ. And then the, the, the concept of ECMO has come up. And of course, no, before that, I mean, we live in a, we live in a, what do you call a developed country where the infection is the major cause uh, of uh, the morbidity and mortality. And these patients being on immunosuppression and lungs being, I mean, very exposed to the environment and these um, the infective complications are very more common in the lung transplant patients. I think that was a major thing which uh, has uh, basically prevented, I can say prevented or, you know, there's, uh, this program has okay. not come Okay. I think and the more thing is legalities also. They are men. They are people are apprehensive about the legalities. So they are as a uh, pulmonologist or the you know the lung transplant physicians. You are not very comfortable dealing with this organ transplantation. This apprehension that you will cause it all. I mean, you know the un, uh, unnecessarily legal issues. So I think it's 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 uh, necessary for you also to keep updated about the legalities of organ transplantation. You should okay. uh, like this forum. You should discuss about the legalities. Now, who are who can be a donor? What is the brain death? In what circumstances? You know, I mean, now we can take the organ apart from the scientific, like optimizing a donor and organ transplantations. Perfect, perfect. Now, ma'am, also in your uh, you know presentation, you told us about how well Telangana is doing, and you obviously have been a very important part of. Uh, part of you know development of you know organ donation in the state of Telangana. Do you think India right now should have uniform laws for every state? You obviously showed us a map as to which state is you know performing how. Exactly. Do you think there should be some uniformity of laws all over India, uh, or do you think that unfortunately donation and transplantation will be concentrated in certain states? Now this is a huge debate which are going to talk tomorrow in ISOT. There is one day, the whole of one day is dedicated for that. With the, all these photos, photos, and notos. So, we are going to have a debate about that. But ultimately, the long term goal should be that, you know, we should have a one, uh, you know, one country, one, uh, you know, policy, organ donation policy, and one registration, not like patient, uh, you know, registered from multiple states with multiple entries. So, you should look at one nation and one organ allocation policy. But having said that, India is, a, as you know, you know, in, uh, diversity. I mean, you should look for yeah. unique, unique yeah. diversity as well. So, but uh, it's, it will be a difficult challenge. Particularly when I see different states are in that different level of uh, the organ transplantation programs, the you know our government state being uh, like you know uh, doing very well, 
though we are not able to meet the what it is demand there are few states where this has not been started at all so i think we should take that into consideration you should actually able to divide that you know patient may like at least one or two areas where we can club payment states which are performing well and then you can start with a uniform program with the states who are not performing well so that they have the advantages of you know uh, moving uh, um, in, uh, together and slowly all these states should come up and then have a, a unified uh, things so i think we should have a long term goal and uh, smaller steps to reach that goal okay and i just hope that every state will follow the telangana model and you know this, this should rapidly disseminate all over india so that we have a lot of uh, uh, organ donors now i would again like to get uh, dr vinay kumar sir on sir you i mean as i mentioned before you are a practicing pulmonologist for the past 15 years you have your own setup uh see it's very easy from one side for all of us to just read up uh, guidelines and to refer a patient to lung transplant you know but i want to ask you practically in your day to day practice when do you start this whole discussion about lung transplantation with the patient in front of you uh, that's an interesting thing sir because uh, referral of a patient in fact in any transplantation and evaluation for the transplantation usually takes time so ideally this uh, process should be complete uh, before the patient becomes very ill or otherwise it should be should not become very urgent transplantation so as it is a multidisciplinary approach and patient should be ideally it should be in a good condition to go process of uh, evaluation so that uh, certain modifiable risk factors can be looked after so that the transplantation success rates uh, will become good so all these things should be kept in mind i believe early referrals uh, if you feel that the disease is progressive and uh, and transplantation may be needed in near future so patient should be referred ideally early so that this process of evaluation will become easy and uh, even for some certain modifiable risk factors can be looked after so i believe uh, okay okay and so so before uh, referring a patient before considering referral in your day to day practice do you discuss with a transplant pulmonologist first or do you just take this call and directly refer the patient usually we'll discuss with the patient first because the need for it should understand that their disease is progressive then we'll give the options uh, then we'll discuss uh, with the transplant surgeon okay okay perfect um, hello, can i can i answer this question because i am facing this problem for the past yeah yeah sure time. definitely so because i could see you know the fast uh, development of the kidney and the liver but somehow that lag is there in the heart and lung transplant i have as i have shown in uh, in our uh, data also this is because there is uh, something like a disconnect between the pulmonologist and the surgeons so they should you know, work as a team and they you know they work as a I mean like you know I mean, uh, uh, when i'm not talking about this uh, group but in general what the what uh, uh, i um, mean you know concept i have realized is uh, they don't refer the patient to the ct surgeon or they don't believe in having a transplant somehow they try to you know prolong with the medications only so i think they should uh, first the uh, the physician's team should be uh, taken into confidence they should be sensitized and the concept of having a transplantation should start at a very early stage when the patient is being treated and they should have a special clinics of you know the heart failure clinics or you know some lung transplant clinics that concept should go and start from the physicians not only the uh, i mean you know pulmonologists but uh, general physicians as well okay ma'am perfectly put i am very happy that there is no cardiothoracic surgeon on this panel otherwise there will be a fight which will start right now and it's always been you know one of the topics of pulmonologists versus a cardiothoracic surgeon but uh, anyways you know on that aspect i would like to get shubham in shubham actually what ma'am has said is 100% true um you know the the concept of lung transplantation unfortunately is just in infancy in india we really need to popularize it you are one of the person who are who is into lung transplantation you must obviously be having various clinics and all do you think anything more should be done to popularize the concept of lung transplant other than what madam mentioned a uh, very good question and uh, to uh, to you know give a short answer the thing uh, that you asked earlier it should be a part of the training for every pulmonologist or every budding pulmonologist the the, the short fall is uh, you know uh, lung transplant is just one question in the final exam that's the whole problem you know uh, indications of lung transplant and contraindications yeah, and people just forget it after they have passed the exam uh, 
it is all about you know the programs like this webinar that help in making people aware so i hope we have a uh, another webinar where we we talk about uh, uh, the indications and contra indications where we actually talk about the right time of referral so the disconnect is not just between the uh, pulmonologist or physician and the uh, cardiothoracic surgeon the disconnect is also between the pulmonologist and the transplant pulmonologist also to be very fair uh, you know to be very frank so the thing uh, is that you know uh, the training should start uh, right during the post graduation days about when to refer right now in the country there are very few and I, and i can actually count on just two finger tips uh, how many uh, tra lung transplant centers are there in the country that are actively doing lung transplants so uh, going forward in future the training not just for the pulmonologist but also for the cardiothoracic surgeons will improve the access for the country people as in uh, our own citizen to lung transplantation in their own individual state and they do not have to hopefully travel to other states if it is available in their own state and that will only come with training and it is not going to happen with even webinars or conferences it is only going to happen with training and like it has started happening with international uh, international interventional pulmonology it should start happening uh, for lung transplant also going forward in the future and i see not maybe not in the next 5 years but 10 years down the line i see lung transplant and heart and heart lung transplants going the way any <laughs> transplant or maybe liver transplant are right now perfectly well put i think the next 10 to 15 years is very crucial you know as far as uh, lung transplant is concerned in india uh you know further just wanted to ask you you know you put it very wonderfully that there, there should be a, a this should be taught as a part of the syllabus and you know there should be some sort of an exposure do you believe that the average pulmonologist probably a dmb or an md student in india should get a sort of a rotation policy in one of the transplant centers probably a 15 day or a one month rotation so they can actually have an in person and an in depth exposure to lung transplant a couple uh, like you 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 have been trained in uh, in the uk for uh, lung transplantation and uh, and you know uh, the unfortunate part about is uh, about it is that most people who want to get trained in in lung transplantation have to go travel to another country to get trained into it uh, so while i have got trained into it uh, working in a transplant center in a lung transplant center uh, the thing is that people should not be able to uh, should not be doing that uh, at least if we talk about the next 5 years people like you have uh, rightly suggested there should be programs where there should be rotation and it should be a part of the policy of the post graduation program rather than the individual center deciding to send their pgs to the centers where we have lung transplant and okay. that's the way forward how we can actually make lung transplantation or heart lung transplantation available to the rest of the country if there is no proper training it is not going to be uh, available in the rest of the country and not just for the pulmonologist and i am reiterating it it should be also for the thoracic surgeons and the cardio cardiothoracic surgeons also that they should get trained into it because uh, while you know cardiac surgeries are a big uh, chunk of uh, their surgeries and uh, international pulmonology and asthma and copd are the big chunk of the pulmonologists work uh you know lung transplantation while the numbers are low right now it will grow maybe 10 15 years like you said but it has to grow and we have to make an effort we being the uh, country with the, the second okay. largest population will have that um, uh, have that number of patients in the future and uh, we will have that burden of the disease in future that will require lung transplantation and if it is not available in multi much more places it is not going to give any benefit to the citizens of the country perfect perfect very well put uh next i would actually like to get a combination of uh, speakers you know so i'm going to pose a question first is to yadukul sir and this will be followed by dr sampath kumar sir uh dr yadukul sir you obviously mentioned about the toxicology you know confounders in brain death you talked about you know uh, possible like for example alcohol uh, which can be done and i just wanted to ask you what investigations would you propose to rule these out and second is do you do you want any of these investigations to be a part of routine donor assessment or should this be case to case basis we can uh, frame few uh, routine tests that can be done in uh, all the transplantation and uh, 
depending as i told it is most of the cases it is uh, like brain dead such cases and uh, more or less it will not be uh, any other toxicological aspect except for the fact of alcohol so we have to look in uh, to the qualitative and qual- uh, quantitative analysis just before uh, the transplantation apart from i think it is more or less related to the case to case basis and and uh, regarding the testing okay. again, if you if you send the uh, samples for um, fsl you, which we usually send it will take months together to get the results but so there are so many toxicological labs now in india where we, you know you know you can get the test uh, results uh, uh, very quickly and that can okay. be optimal okay i would also like to get uh, dr sampat kumar sir's uh, opinion about this whether he wants any specific you know obviously in your presentation you had a list of investigations which includes your angiography and your radio nucleotide uh, studies but uh, which one do you think as far as toxicological encounters is done uh, would you like to add on to some of the investigations you are muted you have to unmute yourself dr sampat dr sampat Yeah, 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 you'll have to unmute yeah, yourself. Yes, sure, sure. Thank you, Dr. Sunilata. Yeah. So the thing is that the final yeah. common pathway uh, performed the word uh, brain death is common, whichever may be the etiology. So when the clinical situation has come, the science and investigations which you aid for brain death is same. So it doesn't matter the etiology. That's why before what you do is the prerequisite I said for clinical evaluation of brain death is we just look into the history only. but as far as concern is concerned by patient patient came to the almost brain dead etiology may not uh, clearly shown by the your uh, the clinical investigations or by uh, imaging with your ancillary test you did so etiology cannot be made any changes in the your clinical examination or ancillary test suppose you take the easy it classically shows that this critical silence where it could be the total brain dysfunction which is reversible irreversible it can be of course talks it only thing is to look into the past history or immediate history what the patient has gone through otherwise the either clinical signs of brain areflexia or from this any ancillary test you do will not give clue to okay. the ideals okay okay perfect i think dr swarnalatha ma'am has got her hand raised she wants to add something yeah yeah so as has been said by dr sampath is a prerequisite to you know rule out or reversible causes including the toxic uh, toxicology so but okay. the, most of the times we get to know by clinical history itself so we don't have to have this toxicology evaluation all the patient as a protocol it could be a case basis but most of the time what we have faced in our i mean you know day to day i mean whatever clinical experience we have is road traffic accident and these road traffic accidents happens because of the you know drunk and drive so you have to take a history of whether he or he was drunk before the accident and like when he had taken last is there in, enough time now if you have any doubt then again you should ask for this alcohol testing and second okay. scenario is unexplained loss of consciousness most of the time we have the you know the with the history we can make out is a trauma it is you know the fall from height or it is an accident or it is a you know uh, the stroke so with this we can make out but sometimes we do we did had a situation where is a young you know uh, the females we don't know what is the cause sudden loss of consciousness and found to be dead in those situation we have to have a complete work up of the toxicology and we did okay. have such situations and even toxicology was completely negative so we did know what to do it could be again viral infections viral infection causing encephalopathy so even that becomes related to contraindication so in those cases we let go the you know cases rather I mean, uh, rather than taking the such, uh, such patients and putting ours in central controversy okay so adding to it uh, just adding to that point see the okay. the state the state the loss stage of brain dead nothing will come to you only thing is the exciting event suppose patient what she said is stroke definitely patient will have some focal deficits patients with trauma something has some focal while meaning encephalitis during the initial part of examination you will have some findings so we we'll look back to the uh, before events what happened to the brain so before what was the past history what the immediate history is taken and all that only will give guide the further investigations by the time the brain death has come i think all this nothing will make for you okay okay thank you so much for that answer uh, next i would like to get uh, dr kinjal modi on uh, sir actually you know there is a difference between uh, practice in the west and practice in india 
with regards to you know sometimes death is perceived as very emotional over here and sometimes as you mentioned even though a patient has himself consented for organ donation but it is ultimately the family members who basically have a say now basically in the west you got this concept of next of kin which is a specific person documented in every medical record even in the death certificate it has to be one person who is responsible for all the decisions in our country we see sometimes that the entire family is basically involved in decisions and sometimes there can be a, a situation in which uh, let's say the mother says no to organ donation the father says it's okay please go ahead with organ donation how should such a situation be tackled and what is the legal standpoint uh dr kinjal um, yeah kapil yeah perfect perfect yeah 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 please go sir i was just asking yeah. you know sometimes we we've got differences in the family members one will say yes the other will say no how to yeah. go ahead in such a situation and what is the legal implication uh the so legal implication basically as a uh, in initial part of also talk i told you that uh, there is something called as next to kin who take the decision so in indian laws uh, if a person is uh, uh, brain dead then next to kin has the right to take decision uh, that he can definitely go ahead and can do the donation if he agrees but if there are uh, all the people who are there is no exact uh, labeling in in our legal system that uh, if i am going to be unfortunately brain dead some point of time so and so person is appointed to it itself that he will be my next to kin so unfortunately indian setup when a person is branded we have many relatives which are next to kin and taking decision for example as you told that if son is uh, branded and both the parents are there father is convinced and he agrees but mother says no then hmm. if any single person even says no you cannot go for it that's the only simple answer okay that you should have all relatives on single page then only you should go for lung transplant otherwise you cannot uh, any transplant sorry okay perfect uh next i would like to ask dr swarnalata ma'am actually ma'am in your uh, presentation you had one slide which was dedicated to transplant coordinators and on three occasions you mentioned that if you have a good transplant coordinator 50% of the work is basically taken care of now my question is could you just elaborate a bit more about transplant coordinators who exactly can become a transplant coordinator what can be the possible courses through which a person can become a transplant coordinator madam i think you are on yeah. mute you like yeah, to yeah, yeah. yeah. Perfect. so as i said in my presentation they are the key person so like uh, but, but unfortunately we don't have a structured training program so in the recent amendment of 2014 the i mean uh, it said the acts is uh, any person with a uh, you know life sciences uh, graduation preferably if it is a uh, you know psychology can be a coordinator and uh, and like uh, anybody from medical background it can be you know the mbbs guy or it can paramedical sub nursing staff or technicians can be a, a coordinator so we but we have to train them because they come from a science background so they know something about you know the uh, this terminology and all the other things so they can be trained but they has they have to be trained properly but again there is no proper structure training program in any of the universities in fact we I mean recently in nims is a university so we were trying to have the paramedical courses the graduate courses so we have recommended you know course paramedical course uh, you know graduation course for the uh, uh, the uh, the coordinators as well so but there are only few ngos who are giving a, a certificate course so that's how we have come up with a, a course in fact we have tried the, this uh, to share this with a noto also so noto is also now coming up with a you know certificate uh, course for the transplant okay. so i mean wow. again because it is evolving you should have a you know uh, the broad specialty something like you know having a knowledge in everything the, the, the donor part the recipient part recipient again various organs and again so specialization particularly now yours is like lung transplant they have certain yeah. specifications so we can evolve like uh, having a, a special a specialized uh, training program as well okay ma'am i would just i'd like to ask you one more question you know usually in a hospital when because you you've been involved in organ transplantation for such a long time i just want to ask you this question usually when you have a patient who you are sort of suspecting might go into brain death and you know, who is the person and when is the correct time to start a uh, discussion uh, with regards to organ transplantation yeah so this is again a tricky situation so what is the time to you know counsel there is always uh, when we talk to the neurologists 
so there's always a like you know game like you know you first declare then we will talk to my family member you then uh, the neurologist say you just try to counsel the family member that agreeing then we'll go for a you know the declaration part because it's a I mean, difficult task but then as per the legal structure so it, it, you should delink between the declaration and the organ donation so they, it's not like I mean, organ donation is not always the declaration is not always linked to organ donation so it should be a natural a clinical judgment or clinical assessment when you make a day to day rounds we don't take concern for everything you, unless it is a major procedure so it should be done as a basic uh, clinical assessment so we should able to do the first declaration but ideal time would be now once we have first declaration done because um, as per the act there are two declaration we have enough time so legally it's only it should be only after the two declarations we should able to approach the family members for for all the logistic reasons because it again you know the uh, uh, optimizing the patient calling the recipients the moment we declare a sam in second and then we do, we do a counseling to the family members they say oh, okay we'll give but give the body immediately within you know one hour you just take the organs and give the body so this is yes. what they say so because the logistics is a very major issue so that's why we what we have done is we do a first declaration first dec- after the first declaration now we are sure that patient is brain dead you know scientifically though legally we have not put it on paper so all the legal matters is only after second declaration you know putting the form filling the form 8 as per the old and form 10 as per the new uh, the act and then taking the consent only then we can you know approach the family members but now looking at the log- logistics and various things involved first after first declaration we start you know counseling the family members so we we see their the state of mind we try to convince them you know it's again counseling is a multiple step procedure it's not a single step procedure we take them through we try to you know assess their uh, mental status or their level of acceptance or denial mode and then try to you know counsel them for the brain i mean uh, the organ donation and it ends with the okay. second declaration so that we have enough time okay i think um yeah so uh, i would just like to mention to all the viewers that ma'am is right now in nagpur you know she's attending the isot conference and she has a she has an international delegate to attend to uh, we are almost uh, i'll just be asking the last question to shubham but if you feel ma'am if you feel the need you want to go and attend the delegate we will absolutely understand okay Yeah. So I, so I mean, like, thank you for giving me the opportunity. And in future, if you have any like you know, in uh, guidance or any clarification, I'm always available. I'll be happy to help you out uh, in uh, building your own programs. And if in reciprocation, if I need to learn from you people, I'm always you know ready to learn and then uh, take this program to a next level. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so thank much, you. ma'am. So much. Thank you, ma'am. ma'am. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. so uh, you know unfortunately man had to you know attend to certain delegates and that's the reason so i just come to the last question of this q and a session and i would like to direct this to shubham shubham you have touched about this in your presentation but i would just like to you know just keep a very short answer what is the timeline basically for lung harvesting and the second is what exactly do you mean by a donor recipient match what all should you see once you are assessing the donor so uh, the timeline should be uh, now uh, with the with the better data available you know initially it used to be that you harvest is uh, harvest it early uh, the patient should not be on a long term ventilation and everything but now uh, the dbd uh, especially uh, this uh, death after circulatory death also we are seeing that uh, the there is improved outcomes in terms of recipient survival if uh, if the donor organs are taken after 72 hours on ventilation if the uh, donor organs are good uh, that also improves not just the survival and but also improves the chances of uh, uh, so uh, decreases the chances of uh, rejection decreases the chances of infection because you have had that time uh you have given that time to the lung uh, lungs to heal uh, better once they they have undergone an injury especially after road traffic accidents uh the other question uh, that you asked was uh, what what do we look uh, for in terms of donor matching with recipient so there are three basic points uh, that we look uh, look up to uh, once we have a appropriate donor a potential donor uh, the uh, abo uh, compatibility the blood grouping matching Uh, the size of the lungs which can be directed by the patient's height and sex and uh, it uh, can also be directed by tlc measurement and of course hla matching has to be done it is not available immediately but uh, again donors uh, hla and pra levels uh, can be a guide a guidance towards it uh, i am sorry i forgot your third question
couple got disconnected, I guess. Uh, Kapil just messaged that he has logged off, uh, so uh, 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 I, I'll do the honors uh, on his behalf, uh, if that's okay. Uh, I would like to thank all the panelists on behalf of uh, Chess Council of India, Dr. N. H. Krishna and Dr. Vijay Chinnam Chetty. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, also congratulate everyone, especially the delegates attending this uh, webinar uh, in such high numbers. Uh, see, brain death is something that we don't talk about, lung transplantation, indication, uh, we don't talk about it too much. A uh, couple uh, back, <laughs> I was doing the honor. So, uh, so we don't, I'll just continue what I was saying. So we don't yeah. talk about it too much, uh, but uh, in terms of numbers uh, of audience, uh, or de audience delegates, uh, so it is so heartening to see people actually coming up uh, for this cause. And I really hope that in going forward in future, uh, not just organ donations, but the thoracic organ transplants also pick up just like they have picked up for kidney and lung transplant. We just started in 2012 in our country. And maybe we have another five to 10 years to make it as, uh, as so at par with the kidney and liver transplants in the country. Okay. Thank you so much, Shubham, for those wonderful words. And I would also once again like to thank CCI. And there are certain people in particular that I would like to thank, apart from all the speakers and the panelists. Dr. Krishna, sir, Dr. Narayan Pradeep, sir, Dr. Atri, Dr. Ravi Dosi, Dr. Vijay Kumar, Chenam Chetty, Garu, uh, Dr. Anil Maske, and Dr. Ashish Dubey, sir. All of these in particular, I would like to thank on behalf of all the speakers as well as the panelists. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sahib, nice program you can make.